Welcome to On and Off the Mic with Mike Corey. I was fortunate to get to meet and work with Stan Van Gundy for a couple of years after his coaching stint with the Orlando Magic, as we did college basketball together on NBCSN. He's so down to earth, it's like hanging out with your neighbor. But he's a wealth of knowledge when it comes to basketball, and he has some great stories. After coaching the Detroit Pistons, he's back working with us now on ESPN. It was great to catch up with him once again. It's been a while. I haven't, uh, haven't caught up with you in a little bit. What's been going on? Well, not a whole lot. I mean, you know, when you, uh, when you get fired and, and you've been unemployed for 14 months, there's, there's not a whole lot going on. But, I'm, you know, I'm sitting by my pool in uh, Central Florida uh, talking to somebody I like right now. So <laughs> life ain't bad either. So, you know, I can't really complain. <laughs> hey, you and I are going to probably work on every uh, network known the man at some point, right? Because we we started on NBC, uh, then you went back into coaching. Now, now we're on ESPN, right? Well, what else you got going on? Well, you know what? I mean, I, I enjoyed the year on ESPN. They had me uh, bouncing around doing different things. I did one NBA game. I did three college games. Um, I did some NBA countdown in the studio. And I did some morning shows and the jump and, and then I do Levitard's radio show, uh, one day a week. I did his TV show once. So I, I was sort of, um, I'm a bench guy or I was at ESPN, you know, um, anytime somebody couldn't make something, it, it's, you know, call Stan and he subs, he subs <laughs> it for people. And, um, so it was fun cause I got to do a lot of different things. And I'm just waiting now, Mike. To, I mean, you, I'm sure you've been in this situation. To, uh, you know, you're just in a waiting game seeing what, if anything, anybody's going to offer you for the coming year. So, um, you know, we'll see. Hopefully I'll be doing something, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, hey, I had a great time calling those games with you, man. Hopefully we get to do uh, more of that. You never know. I mean, is that – do you enjoy that the most or do you like the other stuff too or the studio or, you know, all the other different things that you were doing? Well, I think all of us, right. I mean, would rather be in the arena doing games. I mean, you know, um, getting the feel for the crowd and the excitement of the game. And, um, and to me, even though it takes a lot of preparation to do a game um, and you're one of the most prepared people I've ever been around in anything, um, even though that preparation is there, um, to me, it's easier. Like you're in the studio and you're, you're having to manufacture things to talk about, you know, right. um, you're at the game, the game tells the story and, and you sit there and you have your preparation, but you tell the story of, of what's going on on the court. And, and so, um, to me, I, I enjoy that the most and, I actually have never had more fun than I did um, that two years with NBC Sportsnet um, work in those Atlantic 10 games. Um, I learned a lot. I mean, you taught me a lot. Kevin Smolin, one of the producers, taught me a lot. Um, you know, Dan Steer taught me a lot. Um, so those were really learning times for me um, where professionals – uh, taught me a great deal. And so um, it was, it's always fun learning something new also. We had a blast, man. That was great. I, I enjoyed that time. And especially when we were in, uh, where were we? Brooklyn, right? I think yeah, some- that was fun. Yeah. yeah, to hang out afterward. I just love listening to all your stories, and I think those are one of those times where everybody that's at the table just sits back and you know, you you know, you tell us uh, what you've uh, you've come across. It's just amazing, you know, like all the travels and places you've been. Yeah, well, it was a lot of fun, and, and it was funny because, you know, I remember, I mean, we had the one real controversial game um, right. where Langston Galloway for St. Joe's pushed off against Dayton and then was able to make the shot, and, you know, Dayton at the time, Archie Miller was worried it was going to cost him an NCAA bid, and St. Joe's went on and, and won the Atlantic 10 tournament. And then I ended up coaching Langston in uh, Detroit, and I laughed with him about that play several times about, you know, um, him pushing off and, and hitting the game winner. And he said, which is just what we said on the air, he said, yeah, but I still had to make the shot. 
And I right. said, that's exactly what we said on the air, Lang. Exactly what we said. That's cool, man. Like, how, how great is that? Like, some of the guys that you've met, you know, throughout your time, and then you end up coaching them or we're, we're broadcasting. I mean, the, the, the way the things cross paths, you know, throughout, you know, you don't it, – it's interesting, but it's, it's pretty cool, you know, when that happens. No, there's no question. I mean, you know, and, and when you get down to it, I mean, the, the basketball world, probably the sports world, you, you, have it, you know it on a broader – scale than I do but the basketball world is a is a pretty small world you know I mean you know there's the players and the coaches and front office people and the people who broadcast the games I mean and it it becomes a pretty small world and so you're never very far removed from from knowing somebody I mean you know and and even if I meet a if I do a game and I meet a broadcaster for the first time, I mean, we're going to have six, eight, ten mutual friends um, yeah. that we've worked with. I mean, and and that's in with me, with a very short history in broadcasting. So, um, you know, it, it is. It's a small community. What um, What do you and your brother uh, talk about? Because I mean, we know we we watch him a lot all the time. He's been doing it for years now. And I know I saw you on a game. I think with him uh, combined this year as well. What's uh, What's like your relationship like and all that? I mean, would you talk to him a bunch about, you know, about it and the, the broadcasting field and all that? Well, we talk all the time. I, I would say, Mike, we talk more basketball than we do actual broadcasting. Man, the broadcasting comes up within it. Um, mm-hmm. So it's not like we don't talk about it, but we talk more about what we're seeing on the court and things like that. And obviously, um, he's just totally ensconced in the uh, in the NBA, um, and I've learned a lot from from watching him. Um, I'm nowhere near as good as he is. Um, I'm biased, but I don't think there's anybody better in the in the business as an analyst. I, I think he combines great knowledge of the game, and and he can communicate it in a way that fans can understand it. He doesn't try to talk over anybody's head uh but he's also he takes his job seriously but he doesn't take himself seriously and so he has some fun with it and enjoys the game and but i what the main thing i learned from him and i know i said this to you way back when we were working together i mean you guys the play-by-play guys have the tough job and you guys are the broadcast professionals and how good an analyst looks always comes down to how good the play-by-play guy is. And, you know, Jeff, you know, talks about Mike Breen, who in my mind is probably the, the best guy in the business in the NBA. And then when I worked with a guy like you, a professional, and you come in highly prepared and, you know, I knew nothing at that time. And you just set me up to where I could talk about basketball and stuff that I, I did know. Um, but the hard job's on you guys. Ah, right, thanks. I appreciate it. I mean, I always look at it the other way because I'm kind of saying the same stuff, you know, over and over, you know, at times that it's really you guys are the ones that have to come up with the things that, you know, people don't know or you know, tell us what we really didn't understand about the play. I mean, but, you, you know, you're right. I, I think Breen's, you know, he's one of my favorite. I mean, he's one of the best and, and your bro is great too. And, and I take a lot of things from him. And when I'm talking to other analysts about it, too, because he's perfect with what he's saying and he says it in a way where it's not, you know, like a broadcaster, like, hey, da, da, da. He's like, he talks to you like you're hearing, like you're seeing it yourself. And then, you know, when somebody makes a play, he'll continue his comment, at, you know, as LeBron scores and blah, blah, blah. And, and I like that, you know, nobody's getting interrupted and it's just, uh, it's a good flow, you know, and I think, and you know that too, the way you do it, you have fun and. You just, you know, you enjoy it, and that's, and that's the best. You know, when you, when you take it too seriously, that's, that's when it can become a problem, you know? I mean, you got to have fun. Yeah, there's no question. And, and when you and I were doing those Atlantic 10 games, um, you know, it, when I was doing those games, Mike Breen, of course, went to Fordham. And so Mike would watch Fordham games. When, and we didn't have a lot of Fordham games because uh, they weren't very good at the time but had one or two a year and Mike would watch the games. And, and so, you know, my brother said, Hey, you should ask Mike to, to give you some feedback. And so I did. And, and 
Mike gave me a lot of good things, but um, the, probably the biggest one was, and he still says it all the time, and he texted it to me on this one NBA game I did this year when he thought I was getting too negative, and he, he just texts, celebrate the game. Um, <laughs> and he says it to my brother all the time because from a coaching background, you tend to be pretty critical because – as a coach, what you're trying to do is correct the things that aren't going well. You, yes, you applaud the plays that go well, um, but the immediate thing is you got to fix the problems. And so you're so tuned into seeing the problems that my reaction to a play, a guy might make a great offensive play, and my first thought will be what the defense did wrong. Right. And <laughs> that's what I want to, you know, that's what I'll immediately talk about and Mike will always say celebrate the game you know you you don't have to get to the negatives all the time I mean certainly you want to point out a team's problems but you also want to you know illuminate the fans as to what they just saw and how great that is and why and and I'm not to this day I don't have a lot of experience and I'm not great at that but um, you know, I need to bring myself back to that when I do get the opportunity to do games or even working in the studio. And, and I've got to watch it with that. I have problems with that part of it. It's hard, man. It's a, it's a balancing act, right? I mean, yeah, you look at it like in the eyes of the coach and you want to, you know, you want to tell them what they need to do. And, 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 and I get it. I mean, there's, there's a way to do it, right? I mean, sometimes the guy's playing well and he's doing this, this, and this, right. But he's messing up here and you gotta, you gotta find a creative way to, to get them to get that part better, you know, and then sometimes it's not always just going right after that to begin with, you know, you got to, Hey, good job here, here, and here, but I need you to do blank, <laughs> you know, maybe the same way, I guess on the air with, uh, with other plays and stuff too, you know? Well, no, exactly. Like, you know, it, instead of pointing out, you know, as like, I'm very good at pointing out on how the defense was out of position and missed a rotation. Um, but the other side of it, is, you know, how the offensive player read that, you know, situation and where the guy was out of position and saw the opportunity for the back cut, you know, being able to point that out and show it on a replay or talk about it makes the exact same point about the defense being out of position, but in a positive way of how the offense – saw it and made the right read, um, there's, there's just something that, you know, I need to get a lot better at. Um, but, you know, it's good to have somebody critiquing you. I mean, one of the things that I found um, interesting coming out of a team situation is it's, it's hard to get feedback. Um, you know, like you have to, and Dan Lebetard tells me all the time, you know, it, it's, it's not something that people naturally do, particularly with analysts, because they get carried away with you guys, with the analysts supposedly being the experts. And so nobody wants to say, hey, you need to do this, you need to do that. You have to let them know that you want that to get the feedback. And so, I've really tried to do that in the past year, like really ask for feedback, like what did you think and the whole thing. And like the producer on NBA Countdown, Amina Hussein, I mean, once I, you know, once she was comfortable with the fact that I wanted that, I mean, she would send me clips after I was on the air, um, even in a studio show and say, you know, I like this. And this could have been better, and this is why, and the whole thing. And I like that. That's what I'm used to in a sports environment is let's go to the tape and figure right. it out. And, you know, after games as a coach, yeah, you're breaking down your players, but you're also breaking down yourself all the time, you know, and your staff is giving you feedback on, you know, we should have probably done this here and this here. And, and I don't look at that as – negativity that's like a chance to improve and so I'm comfortable with that and 
I found out you really have to ask for that. But once you do, you can get some good feedback from people uh, that can make you better. No, no, no doubt. I mean, and you know, you've kind of gone back and forth. That's the thing. I mean, it's, it's hard. You, you need like a considerable amount of time and games and, and reps, as you know, like, like as a player or a coach or anything to, to be as where you want to be. I mean, boy, you're coaching the magic and you're doing the games at NBC. Now you're coaching the Pistons. Now you're back on ESPN. I mean, you, you've had so many different things. Like, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't beat yourself up. You know what I mean? There's like a no. lot of, you know, yeah, it's there crazy. Is. And I've probably still only done in the neighborhood of 40 games, you know, being an analyst on games. And, and, you know, I mean, I I listen to these guys and, you know, whether it's my brother or, you know, Hubie Brown or, or even a John Barry. And then when I get ready to do the college games, you know, now after sort of a four year break from it, um, you know, I see some other guys, um, that I didn't know who I, who I think are very, very good. And, and, um, you know, you try to, you try to learn from those guys, um, you know, and do the best you can. And the only thing that I know for sure is it, that is just like coaching is, you know, there's two things to me is number one, you've got to be yourself. I mean, you can't try to be those guys. You've got to be yourself. And number two, the value of preparation and, And as you know, because I told you several times when I worked with you, the thing I respected most about you when I worked with you is you were so highly prepared. And and I have, that's what I respect in other coaches when I watch them or I coach against them is how well prepared their teams are. Um, And really when I've observed people in any other business, the first thing I tend to notice is the level of preparation and the more highly prepared you are, I think in anything, the more natural you come across because you're comfortable with the material because you're prepared for it. And, and you were always great in that regard. I always, you know, when I was working with you, I always said like, you'd come in with that card. I'm like, Oh my God. I mean, I marveled at your yeah. preparation. Like I thought I was prepared and, yeah. and I wasn't like within you know, 50% of what you were doing. And so I've tried to raise my game since then, if I have to do a game in terms of being prepared. Join our friends from the Delaware Kids Fund and Harvey Hanna and Associates for the 10th annual Delaware Kids Fund 5K in Newport, Delaware on Saturday, August 3rd to help fight childhood hunger. To register and for full info, visit dekidsfund.org. Yeah, but you know what? And listen, it means a lot, and I appreciate it. It really does. And I, but I've learned over the years too to kind of try to dial that back a little bit. You know, actually, it's funny. I did a um, I did a show like we are here today with um, with Mike Gorman, who I know I'm sure you know does the oh, Celtics. Yeah. TV. And he, he told a story about how he had this whole elaborate board, uh, his first NBA game, work with Tommy Heitzen, and he looks over and he, and he sees the stuff and he asks him what it is. And he's like, well, those are my notes for the game. And he reaches over and he crumples them up and he throws them off the first balcony of the uh, Boston Garden back in the day. And he says, we don't need that. He says, we're going to talk about what's in front of us, you know? <laughs> and it's like, and Mike says from that point on, he doesn't really go do these elaborate boards and notes anymore. And I, and I said to myself, wow. And I'm like, but there is a happy medium in between and, and don't get me wrong because he's one of the best and it doesn't mean he needs to do this but somewhere a happy medium between putting this whole big thing together with everybody's brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and then not doing anything you know what I mean because you do right. need to react and I mean I was going to ask you that it's like you know you bust your butt as a coach and you've, you're watching all this film all this tape and you're showing all the players like you know, the plays and, and where you need to be and the rotations and the inbounds plays. And then all of a sudden, I'm sure, and you tell me, <laughs> you've gone into games and then it's just like, you know, so-and-so just takes over or so-and-so hits a shot or so-and-so makes a play. It has nothing to do with the way it was drawn up. And you're like, Jesus Christ. You know, <laughs> I mean, you could like go. No, crazy, that's, ex- right? that's exactly what, right. Right. What is it like, especially in the NBA? And you're just like, all right. <laughs> I mean, it's wild, but you can't go in with nothing. But if you go in with everything, and sometimes the guy doesn't even follow the play, and it just happens, you know? I mean, how many now, times has it happened? I think it's, it does. But, and here's the thing. You're, almost every game you're going to have to adjust from your game plan you went into. But that 
is where, to me, your preparation, not just for that game, but over the, you know, span of your entire career, you know, continually putting the time into preparation and watching film and, and knowing opponents and, and all of those things helps you with those adjustments because after you've been in it a while, you've seen it all and, and you can adjust. Had you not put the time in and prepared, you know, maybe not. And, and I would say, like, you look at a, lot, a guy like Mike Gorman, right? I mean, first of all, he's doing one team. So, right, right. And, and so his preparation is he watches them every single night. So it's a little <laughs> different situation than what you're doing, say, like when you and I were doing the Atlantic 10. Right. You know, you may not see a team. Now, by the time you get to the tournament, yeah, you've got your stats in front of you, but I don't know how much I look down at them. You know, maybe if I wanted to check myself on something, but by then we'd seen those teams and you sort of know what to expect. But, you know, like I haven't done a lot of college basketball for four years. And then this year, you know, I go in for the, for the first time and I do – um, I do Texas, uh, Oklahoma State. Well, I don't know either right. team. I know Shaka Smart from our time in the Atlantic 10, but, but I don't really know either team. I mean, I made sure I watched, I think, four games of each team going in. And because I can't talk about what I think somebody might do in a situation if I've never watched their team play. So, sure. you know, you need that kind of preparation. If I had watched, if I was, Texas basketball's TV analyst and I was at every game by the time I got to game 15 yeah I don't need to keep yeah doing a lot extra I know what they're gonna do that's that's a good point that's a good point <laughs> oh man I'm just you know I'm looking back and thinking now I remember when you started your career because I, I grew up in uh, Vermont in Brattleboro Vermont so I know you were there what Vermont for a few years and then Castleton and uh, you know I'm thinking I'm thinking mid 80s here now where I loved watching the NBA and you know a huge Celtics fan from growing up in there yeah how much different would it have been like if you feel like if you were coaching during the 80s like would you have loved being a part of any of those teams like you know in the 80s like compared to what it is today I mean I can't even imagine I'm like I'm just trying to gather from you like how ridiculously different the NBA is now where it's like you know you and I are going out playing freaking pickup ball and we're picking our team you know it's like it's ridiculous I mean it really is well and things change all the time and in some ways they're they're cyclical I mean I think the advantage in the 80s is there wasn't as much player movement there was certainly some but not as much. And, and so, you know, you would see, especially the really good teams, the key guys would remain the same year after year. Um, and so the, uh, the rivalries really continued to grow because it was the, it was the same people all the time. And, and right. so, you know, so you look and there, there's a Lakers Clippers rivalry because they're in the same city, but, now you look again, it's all new players on both sides. And so they don't, have a, they don't have a history. I mean, even when I was first in the league in the 90s as an assistant to Pat Riley, the Heat and the Knicks, when my brother was with the Knicks, we had a great rivalry. And, and not all, I mean, I think the two things in the NBA that produce a rivalry is, number one, you've got to play multiple years against somebody in the playoffs, um, yeah. which we did. Um, three or four times. And, you know, the players have to remain somewhat consistent. So you build up that animosity, <laughs> that yeah. competitiveness over time. I mean, even the regular season games between those two teams with Riley's history with the Knicks and my brother and then the players going at it, Every year, the same guys, Alonzo against Patrick Ewing, Dan Marley against Allen Houston. You know, I mean, all of those things going on, Tim Hardaway being guarded by Charlie Ward and, you know, and Chris Childs and, you know, it, all of those things. Um, 
lead to great, great rivalries. And I don't know if we have that now. I mean, the Cavaliers and the Warriors met four straight times in the finals, and it still didn't quite feel like that because after two years, Durant was added to the Warriors, and that changed things. I mean, there's a star change, not like a role player. And then Kyrie left. Um, it's just different now, and, and it's the new normal in the NBA. And so, yeah, the rivalries aren't going to seem the same as Knicks Heat or, or Celtics Lakers right. or Lakers Pistons or Bulls Pistons. I mean, just too many of the key players change from year to year. Yeah, it, it, exactly. I mean, I, I just loved having those rivalries, though. I mean, you knew every team had an identity. You know what I mean? Uh, it was just every single team had a core group, like you said. It just never seemed to change. And then you'd pick up a guy or two here or there, and it was just fun to watch. I mean, it's fun to watch now, too. You know, I mean, it, it's 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 very popular. We know that. Uh, but I can't imagine what it's like, you know, from – from your perspective, sometimes like when you're out there trying to manage all these personalities and, you know, <laughs> it's just, I mean, any, what kind of stands out to you, I guess, from all your time there, from whether it was the heat, the magic, the Pistons, I mean, what, I don't know, what was like really some of the best times and what was some of the, the times you're just like, I can't believe I got to deal with this, <laughs> you know, people I don't understand. Really, yeah. The I didn't really have those times. Like, you know, I mean, it's more, you know, how are we going to win the next game? That's the, that's the problems because the coaches and the players are all so good on every team that it's just, that it's just hard to win. But I was really blessed with the guys that I had an opportunity to coach. I mean, you know, I, God, I mean, it would be hard for me, particularly as a head coach, to identify anybody that I didn't enjoy coaching I mean there's certainly the personalities are different and some are a little higher maintenance than others but you know for the most part I, I was able to coach guys who were willing to sacrifice for the good of the team and were good guys who worked hard and and wanted to be and wanted to be really good so um, that part of it was was great with me. And then the best of times are, um, you know, when you have a group that is really, really close and when you have a coaching staff that's really, really close. I, I think those times of camaraderie you're together so much are really what makes it uh, enjoyable. And, you know, really working towards something together, not just hanging out, having fun, but going through tough times and and trying to accomplish something with people that you have great respect for and and that's where I was able to reside throughout my entire NBA career both as an assistant and as a head coach so so I feel very fortunate yeah hey what's it like with like the grind of the season you know the 82 games it's kind of non-stop you got back-to-back -back games I can only imagine that I mean I I, I mean I do probably I don't know, maybe about 50 games a year now with like college football, basketball, and lacrosse. And I mean, I, I travel a decent amount. I mean, I'm probably nowhere close to some of the guys who do like 100 games. I mean, I don't think I'd want to do more than maybe 60 or 65. But here's the NBA with like an 82 game season. Like, well, what, could, what would you say about that? Like, you know, the travel and all the, the different contests and cities. I mean, was it a, did you get tired after a while? Did the players get tired? I mean, what was that like? Oh, yeah, fatigue certainly a part of it. But, I mean, let's understand that, you know, you're in the NBA, you travel very well. I mean, you know, it, it's a lot different than traveling as a broadcaster. Like, I only did 30 days this year. You know, you're a broadcaster, though, and we, I did a game in Ames, Iowa, and then, you know, got delayed by eight hours getting out because of a snowstorm. And, like, we don't have that in the NBA. You're flying charter, you know, yeah. You go, they take their bags out of the back of your car for you. Um, and the next time you see your bag is when you're in your hotel room in a five-star hotel somewhere, um, you know, and you're flying charter and they're feeding you. I mean, it, it, it's – so it's a lot of travel, but it's not anywhere near um, 
what most people are going through traveling. So, so there's that part of it. And you're competing against people who are going through the same thing. So some nights you're more tired than your opponents. Sometimes they're more tired than you are. It, it all balances out over, over 82 games and the adrenaline's flowing. I mean, where I felt it was at the end of seasons. I mean, my wife would tell you, you know, at the end of seasons, you know, I'd still be going into work, but I would come home and literally just fall asleep. I mean, like the adrenaline flows out of your body at that point. You realize you've been living on adrenaline and you're so sleep deprived and you try to catch up on it. And I'd have two weeks where I'd be sleeping between naps and everything, you know, 10, 12 hours a day. I mean, it was crazy before my body adjusted back to, you know, Mm -hmm. normal, but you know, everybody in the NBA is going through it. And so there's sort of an equality to it and the excitement of the games and all of that is what keeps you going. If you have any advice to me on how I can like be better getting to things with more time to spare, I'd love to hear that. Like that's the, <laughs> new thing. that's the biggest thing I'm working on right now, right? Like is leaving more time for stuff. Like my wife tells me that all the time. She's right. Everything takes longer than you think. And, and I try to plan and you never know, like, you know what I mean? Like even driving somewhere, I, <laughs> takes you 15 minutes you got to leave like a half an hour or 40 minutes or whatever yeah never- yeah i've <laughs> always been that because i get stressed out by time so i'm usually really really early early okay. um you know i i just because then i'll relax and then i can right. do something when i'm there when i think like i had i didn't have a choice this year But I was doing, I don't know, I had something the night before, and I had to get to Ames, Iowa, and I was flying the day of the game, and the weather was awful. And I didn't think, I mean, I ended up making it in plenty of time. I didn't think like I was going to make it for shoot-arounds or anything. And I was like, oh, shit, you know, and and I'm like calling Shambi and the whole thing and like, I'm not going to make it. He's like, the game's at seven. Chill out. I mean, you know, like, <laughs> relax. Like, you'll you'll be fine. Like, you know, don't worry about it. And, uh, you know, but it's – I stress about time. And so, like, my, my family hates it because if we have a flight, I'm going to be at the airport at least two hours before the flight. My family's like, what the hell? All we do is sit around the airport. They're always bitching. I'm like, hey. I don't have to worry. I don't have to run through the airport. You know, every once in a while, I'll get in the airport and I'll go, oh, shit, I left something in my car. No big deal. I got time to go back. I just, I know I would stress out. So I just leave myself plenty of time. It's totally fine. It's the right thing to do. Like, we always joke around because my parents, they're always, you know, very early too. And we call it Corey time. And we say, oh, we'll be there. (laughs) They're a one. They're always sitting there waiting for you at 1245. And you know what? I, I finally, it finally hit me. Like I used to get so pissed off about it. I'm like, man, I got to get there. Like, because I was always rushing. Cause I was, I would have like, Hey, I don't have to meet them till one, you know? And there, I know they're going to be there at 1245. So then I got there even a little before one and they're already there. And so yeah. <laughs> you're not going to change that. Like, why don't you wake up and realize they're doing this on for a reason? Like this is a test for you to be like, Get your ass out there earlier and stop stressing. Like if you said one, you should be planning on getting there by 1245. You know what I mean? So I think that's, you're already doing it. So like, I have to learn that. I think that's, I think that's what this is trying to teach me. It's like, stop pushing it, get there early and relax. I've, I've only got my youngest daughter is the same as me on that, but and my oldest daughter, not quite as much, but close. But my two middle kids and my wife, nope, it'll be right up to the – like my wife, will, she'll want to get to the airport an hour before the flight. And then, and then you complain about the security line being too long and, you know, and the whole thing. But that's just – it's just different. Everybody – I've learned to relax on that because they used to drive me crazy. Like, yeah. you know – If I was going to a game, like I'm going to get there really early because I don't want to have any chance I'm going to miss the first pitch at a baseball game. My wife's like, oh, we might miss half an inning of a game that's going to take four hours. And I'm like, yes. Why would I want to miss the first pitch? Come on. You got to get there. 
You got to get yourself some, your concessions, get down to your seats. You know, you want to, you want to have time. My wife's like, yeah, it's all we need more time at the park, you know, <laughs> like rolling her eyes. So it's just different, but I've learned to relax a little bit and they've learned to meet me at least uh, like halfway. So it's been good. <laughs> Well, maybe if you're going to Tampa Bay race, you're not too excited about that place. But, you know, if you go oh, somewhere exactly else. exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, now, you're in Orlando now. Hey, you've always had your place in Orlando, right? I mean, you, you're back there now. Yeah, um, since we moved up here 2007 when I got the magic job, um, yeah. we kept this house. Uh, even when we m moved to Detroit, um, we spent all year in Detroit, but we kept the house and uh, – my in-laws, God bless them, uh, you know, are very handy people and hardworking people. And um, they maintained the house. And I had um, a daughter in school here uh, for all but the first year we were gone. Um, and so she would come down. She was only about 40 minutes away. She'd come down a lot of weekends. So it was still being used. Good, good. Now, and, and also, are you teaching a, a sports uh, business course, I see, what, at Stetson University? When did you start that? I did that last semester. It was contemporary issues in sports, so I didn't have a curriculum. I, I came up with the topics, um, which really sounded, like, good to me, but then you realize, <laughs> like, I've also now got to come up with all the readings and right. the test questions and a class plan and the entire thing. Um, and so we met once a week for three hours. And I got to tell you, I, I had 17 students. I absolutely loved Monday nights going into that class. I mean, the students just energized you. I mean, you know, it, most of them were seniors. They're getting ready to start their career, most of them in sports. And so they were enthusiastic and full of energy and it was just fun to walk in there. Uh, we had great discussions. I loved it, but the amount of work, I mean, I've always had respect for people who teach at any level, but uh, my respect went to a new level after that. I mean, I was spending 15 to 20 hours a week outside of class, just getting prepared and grading tests and coming up with the readings, you know, you have to read, probably three times as many articles as you end up assigning, figuring out what's good, what makes the best points, and, um, and then how are you going to do the class so it's, you know, not the same every time. And, oh, my God, it wore me out. So I'm not going to do it again. And it's not <laughs> I didn't enjoy it. It's just too much work. I, I told the people at Stetson, like, I loved it. You've got great students. It was a lot of fun. And if I'm not, I've said this to people, and it's not just with the teaching. If uh, I, I mean, I'm basically pretty lazy. So if I'm not going to coach, I don't want to work that hard. Like I'll work <laughs> that hard if I'm going to coach. But if I'm not going to coach, no, nah, I want to do a little bit of work. Not, right. not a lot. Like ESPN, <laughs> I did 30 days was my contract last year, plus the Levitard show once a week, and that's from home. I just do it upstairs. That's right. my idea of, you know, work if I'm not coaching. Gotcha. I know, and that was uh, so uh, Stetson, I'm sure, you know, if you will hear the name, but that's uh, what about 45 minutes to an hour north of you in Orlando there? What, Deland, Florida? Is that where that's located? Yeah, Deland. And I'm in Lake Mary, so I'm up north anyway. So a 35, okay. 40 minute drive for me. Gotcha. And, um, you know, I had a daughter who just graduated in May. So, um, it was great because on most of the Monday nights, I would see her after class. We'd, you know, I'd meet her at Starbucks or we'd go get something to eat or, you know, I'd get to see her. So that was, uh, that was an advantage. And, um, you know, I like to think it was a lot of fun for the students too, you know, I mean, because it was, you know, it, there were no lectures. I mean, it was, it was all read the article and, come in and discuss and I would try to moderate and certainly throw in my own experiences and ideas, but really try to get them, them talking and thinking. Cause like I said, they were upper class students starting mm. their own career. I, I had one guy, uh, one kid in my class from New York who uh, wants to be a uh, play by play guy. And 
you know, they get so many more opportunities now, Mike. It's incredible with uh, ESPN3 and all Tell of that stuff. It. Yeah, so he'd done football, basketball, and baseball at Stetson, like the entire time he was in college. And he'd gotten those repetitions. And I'm saying, wow, I mean, this is, this is something for – you know, people who want to do this stuff. I mean, he he's got demo tapes and um, you know, and everything else. And, and so, you know, we had other people were getting into marketing on, on that side. I had a I had a couple of women's basketball players who wanted to go into coaching. Um, I had people who wanted to be uh, wanted to go on to law school and become agents. So we had people who really wanted to work in sports and sort of across the gamut which was good because you know they they brought different perspectives to the discussions and um it's all sports but it but it looks different from different vantage points yeah i I thought of that too you know like they're in college and they're on espn you know essentially and whether it's uh, espn plus or espn3 or whatever and and i'm like you kidding me like it took me 10 years you know after i to get to yeah and you know what there wasn't even espnu or nbc sports network or any of that kind of stuff i mean when i was doing it it was fox cbs nbc you know i mean like what were you gonna do like i was gonna get on those networks and and knock off the number one guy (laughs) i mean it's like it took a while and now everybody's on tv and doing games it's it's nuts no it's and and it's fantastic i remember a, a guy um who i don't know if you've run across or not rich Walt. Oh, yeah. And Rich and I went to the, to the same high school. He was, uh, he was a couple years behind me. His sister was a year ahead of me. Um, and we went to the same high school in California. And so I, I'd gotten to know Rich. I'd known him for a long time. And, and then he became the Marlins uh, play-by-play guy. Mm-hmm. I think he'd been with Seattle. And then he was with the Marlins. And he does some college basketball in the offseason and, and the whole thing. And I remember talking to uh, Rich about how he got started. And, and you're right, they didn't have those opportunities. And so he would go to, like, he'd finagle a press pass when he could. <laughs> and he would go, he was living in Seattle, and he'd go to Supersonic Games, and he would sit there and broadcast the game into a tape player just for himself. Right. You know, sit there and do it. That's how he had to practice because there was, like you said, so limited opportunities to to actually get to be on air. And now, I mean, virtually every – like Stetson is a lower Division One school. Virtually all of their games are on air. Or if not, if not on an ESPN thing, they're at least streamed with an announcer. And right. so your opportunities to, to get repetitions, like a good friend of mine, John Shambi, was saying these kids have more repetitions coming out of college than he had five years into the business. Exactly. Yep. Yep. It's totally different these days. Hey, good for them though. You know, that's, that's, that was always the biggest thing. Like, Oh, I didn't get any experience. Like, well, now you have it. And now you can, you know, move on from here. There's just so many opportunities now for everybody, but it's good because they can get experience. And uh, you know, that's, that's what the biggest thing was like, where do I get my experience? You know, but now they have it. And uh, you know, Hey, same, same with you too. In every, in every aspect. Now you've got a little bit of everything with uh, all the different shows and programs you've done. And that, that's only, uh, that's only going to help you for moving on. Yeah, you hope. I mean, you know, I'd, I'd like to find a, a little bit of a niche, um, you know, but, but I'm not a, um, I'm in a different situation because I'm not a professional broadcaster and it's 60 years old. I'm not really going to have the time to become a professional broadcaster. Like I'm not going to do it for 20 years. I mean, you know, so it, it's just a different situation. And, and you know, I, I hope that you know, I'm able to find some places where um, I can make a contribution with the experience that I have and, and have some fun with it, um, which is really what it's all about for me at, uh, at this point. Mm-hmm. Hey, always fun uh, catching up with you, man. I appreciate it. And uh, hopefully look forward to seeing you when I get down to the uh, Florida area in the near future. So uh, enjoy the summer, all right? 
You too, Mike. Look forward to seeing you on the air in the fall. All right. Thanks, man. All right. Make sure to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss another episode. And you can follow Mike's travels all year long on social media, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and on the web at Mike Corey Sports.